Hi, and welcome to another video from the CTAG clinic. My name is Dr. Mike Lloyd, and I'm the clinic director. In this video, we're going to be continuing the series on conditions associated with dissociation. We're going to be focusing on bipolar disorder. Now, this used to be called manic depression in the old days, and, and now it's bipolar disorder. And there are a number of different types to it. And what we'll be doing is just having a general look at what bipolar is, and then looking at some of the links with dissociation, and then maybe some of the common etiology between the two, i.e. what might be causing these conditions to be present in the same place. So to start with, we'll look at the DSM-5 classification of what bipolar disorder is. And we can largely look at it by thinking about it in these terms. The Bipolar disorder is a group of brain disorders that are categorized by extremes in uh, functional ability and mood and energy. So the, these are disorders of the brain as far as we can tell looking at that definition. There are three different categories or subcategories of bipolar disorder. That's bipolar 1, bipolar 2 and cyclothymic disorder. And here's some background on exactly what those three things are. So bipolar 1 is a, seen as a manic depressive type disorder that can exist both without and with psychotic episodes. Bipolar 2 is, again, depressive and manic episodes, which alternate, less severe, don't really inhibit function. And then the cyclothymic is a cyclic type disorder that causes brief episodes of hypomania and depression. And what we see is that within bipolar disorder, there can be these periods of sort of great excitement or activity delusions or euphoria, which would be the sort of the manic side of things. And then if we're thinking about the depressive side of things, it's sort of like great periods of sadness and hopelessness. And often in clinical practice, what we see is there's sort of the depressive symptoms last for a long time. The manic symptoms last for more acute periods of time. And those are the ones that often bring people into contact with services because the, the overactivity, the driven quality of those manic symptoms are the things that really do cause people a lot of distress, lots of problems, and, and can really sort of attract the attention of services and worry and concern from friends and family. In terms of prevalence ratings, some of the statistics are around about bipolar being in the say 2.5% of the general population. So that's quite a big number. So lots of people do um, seem to have bipolar as a condition and obviously it does vary in, in, in severity in terms of what a person might be experiencing. And there are treatment pathways for this. So it is a, it's quite a, a condition that has a reasonably good treatment outcome. And the, the diagnostic criteria for this is largely dependent on sort of fairly standard features. So there's a list of sort of diagnostic criteria which we'll look through. And then it comes down to sort of the intensity, the frequency and the duration of these. So to look at something like, say, bipolar disorder versus, say, something like borderline personality disorder is often looking at the, the length of time that the, that the symptoms can last for. So whether or not there's a, a sort of the imbalance or the frequency, the upturn of the manic depressive symptoms is occurring over a long period of time or a short period of time, i.e. minute as opposed to weeks can lead someone to you know one diagnostic criteria rather than the other when we're actually looking at this clinically but we're focusing really on the bipolar side of things here so we're looking at sort of fairly intense uh, symptoms that have quite a long duration and, and that will qu qualify for the diagnosis as long as the following things are present and I'll put up a screen just to show you exactly what the diagnostic criteria is and that's coming up now Okay, so that's looked at both the manic side of things, the sort of the behavioral symptom dysfunction type things, and then the sort of the more the, the depressive qualities of that. So that's fine. So we know what bipolar is. It's very well researched. It's very well treated. It's very common. And I've had 10 years of experience working in mental health services with adults. And we saw an awful lot of people with bipolar disorder. It's a very common condition seen in the psychiatric population. One of the things we then need to think about is, is sort of, well, how does dissociation fit into this? And there is this thing that is known as bipolar dissociation. And what is seen is that actually the symptoms of dissociation are seen to be present in many, many people that present with bipolar symptoms. So we're seeing a sort of an overlap between the two things. So a lot of people with bipolar also have dissociative symptoms. 
And generally it's considered within this is that the dissociation is sort of secondary to the bipolar, i.e. the person is experiencing bipolar and as a result of that they then have a sort of a, a set of dissociative type symptoms presenting. So the, the cause, if you like, of the dissociation is coming out of the sort of the extreme bipolar dysfunction. And again, I'm going to put up a, a screen which shows and outlines really what the major sort of bipolar dissociative symptoms are about disconnection, dreamlike states, the concentration, the, the detachment. We've got memory loss and we've got some of those things about time and disorientation kicking in there. So a lot of these things are exactly the same as we see when we're actually we're actually diagnosing dissociation in a sort of a, a complex trauma and dissociation population as seen within the CTAC clinic. So the dissociative symptoms that are present within the bipolar and are known then as bipolar dissociation are fundamentally correct to be known as dissociative symptoms. So we're completely fine with that. What we've got to try and do is sort of break down the sort of the links between these and work out exactly how common this is. And there has been some research on this, but not a great deal. It's an awful lot of research in bipolar disorder, but really not very much in terms of the link between bipolar and dissociative symptoms occurring in the same person. But we do have some. So I'm going to look at a little bit of the research around this. So Steardo and Al in 2021, they found in, in only using a fairly small sample, about 100 people take part in that sample with bipolar, is that there was a link between bipolar and dissociation so that they clearly found that quite a few of those bipolar patients did also have dissociative symptoms. But the really interesting thing is that they noticed that the people that had those dissociative symptoms within the bipolar presentation had a lower response to treatment, i.e. the treatment that was given to people with bipolar was less effective for those people with dissociative so somehow the dissociation got in the way of the bipolar treatment being successful. Rajkumar in 2022 did a larger review. We found out that actually the number of people with bipolar dissociation was running between 10 and 30 percent. So that's up to nearly a third of the population of people in a larger sample group on a review article had dissociation alongside the bipolar. That's a lot of people. And this was also seen in Tekin's 2019 study where he found that about 35% of the people with bipolar also had dissociation. And of those people with dissociation, the largest um, single type of dissociation that was seen was depersonalization, which was running about 17%. So we've got some really clear evidence here that high numbers of people with bipolar also have dissociation, hence why we think of this term as bipolar dissociation. But I really don't think many people know about this. As I've said, 10 years working in CMHDs, lots of bipolar patients throughout our caseloads, and I don't remember any of them being screened for dissociation or dissociation being mentioned at all in the pathway of treatment that we had. Now, that's not a failure of services. It's just a sort of a lack of understanding or appreciation about what's being seen. And I think bipolar is one of those classic conditions where if we start treating the bipolar, that becomes the focus. It's a highly psychiatric led treatment. It's a very, very clear set out pathway within the NHS. It's quite often medication orientated. There are some sort of psychological factors that can come into play to assist people with their bipolar, managing symptoms, managing uh, emotions, uh, fluctuations, change of effect and sort of treatment and, you know, sort of regimes being complied to. But there's a really lack of dissociation actually being mentioned at all. And I don't think anyone's really being screened for this on a regular basis. So I would definitely be recommending that people with bipolar are screened for dissociation because if the research is showing that around a third of the bipolar patients are likely to be dissociative, they absolutely need to be screened for dissociation because if the treatment is not taking dissociation into account, the dissociation is likely to get in the way of a positive outcome for recovery. And that's significant stuff. That means a lot of people are potentially being treated and their treatment is not as effective as it could be because something is being missed on that treatment pathway. So we know that bipolar dissociation exists and we know that the presentation of dissociation within bipolar is exactly the same type of stuff that we see when we're measuring dissociation in a, in a traumatized population. Ah, there we go, right? So there's the word trauma. So we need to truly, really understand, is the dissociative symptoms in bipolar dissociation that built into bipolar. So the bipolar is causing the dissociation or is something else taking place? And that's a really difficult thing to do because this is, again, a very poorly researched area. 
What we can do then is think about the cause of both. We know that dissociation is based on childhood trauma. So the highest risk factor that we possibly have for a person developing dissociation later on in life is a history of childhood trauma, the adverse childhood experiences. If a person has a lot of childhood trauma, well, the risk factor is greater for dissociation. There are many protective factors. Not everyone does become dissociative, obviously, but the risk factor is higher. So then we think, well, OK, what's going on with bipolar? What do we know about the cause for bipolar? And that's where things get really, really interesting, because some of the articles that I've mentioned in the history taking that they've done of the participants in those studies also noticed that there was for quite a large proportion of them a history of childhood trauma. So they're seeing childhood trauma in people presenting with bipolar disorders. And actually, there's a really interesting study in 2016 from us, Henry and Andreasen and others that demonstrates a clear link between the causation of bipolar disorder being related to childhood trauma. And actually what they said there is that childhood trauma was a significant risk factor for developing bipolar disorder later on in life. So in some respects, we can almost predict that people that are presenting with childhood trauma might well go on to end up being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and about a third of those are going to be dissociative. And here are some of the types of things that crop up from childhood trauma that we also see cropping up within dissociation. And I'll just read these out on the screen. The childhood trauma can lead to alterations of affect regulation, impulse control and cognitive functioning, which reduces the ability to cope with stressors. I mean, this is really interesting stuff. So we then we know that childhood trauma can lead to dissociation. And we know that childhood trauma can lead to bipolar disorder and that bipolar disorder is also linked to dissociation in about a third of those people. I mean, this is really powerful in terms of what we actually take from this, because the question that I then come to with this is, well, are we then seeing bipolar dissociation as a sort of like a subcategory of dissociation? Or actually, are we seeing those as being two completely separate comorbid, comorbid conditions that are existing in the same person? So the person both has bipolar disorder and they have dissociation and those are separate conditions in the same person. And if you ignore one and only treat the other, you're in trouble. So if we only if we only tried to if we only treated and diagnosed and treated dissociation we ignore the bipolar disorder there's a lot of problems organic problems in terms of the fluctuation of that person's mania and depressive states that we wouldn't be taking into account and we might be misordering those in terms of what we think that's going on and the reverse is also true if we treat the bipolar disorder ignore the dissociation the person's less likely to become well and that's simply what is known in research to conclude then, I think it's pretty clear that the, the, the research is and our clinical evidence realistically is pointed towards the same sort of thing, that bipolar disorder and dissociation are heavily linked with each other. They both have a very similar cause in childhood trauma and that one is existing in a great number of patients alongside the other. And then the other thing that we know clinically is that I don't think people are taking the two of them into account in the same time. So my advice really for health services and clinicians, if that you have a patient who has bipolar disorder, is do a simple screening test using the DES2 to actually look and try and see whether or not there are dissociative symptoms present. So doing the DES2, it's a 28 point questionnaire. It can lead you to have an understanding whether dissociation is present. And that might also help people understand why some of the treatment pathways for bipolar polar disorder as not as successful as they could be. So we do see these, I think, as a comorbid condition that the two are coexisting in the same person at the same time. And yet one, I think, is being prioritized over the other and both need to be taken into account. So I really hope this video has been helpful. It's a, it might be a really interesting video for anybody with bipolar disorder who really just wants to know a little bit more about the condition and might be asking why they have these other effects taking place that aren't really in the obvious list of bipolar symptoms. And it can magnify the effect of any of those symptoms and it can reduce quality of life and it can reduce the uh, likely treatment effect taking place so it can make that recovery can be a harder thing to achieve. So I'd really be interested in, in receiving and listening to your comments in the in the box uh, underneath the video and we'll keep producing videos. So do all the usual stuff like subscribe. Please share these videos as widely as you would like to. I think it's really great that people are doing so and I'm really, really happy that that's the case. Uh, we'll keep producing videos and we'll continue with this series for the time being. Um, so in between now and the next video, please do take great care.